The Reagan administration, though, even though it suspends arms shipments to the Israelis, the Reagan administration is a transformative administration when it comes to Israel. It is the first administration to treat Israel as a partner and strategic asset. It is the first administration to create an institutional architecture for cooperation. I mean, that may seem striking that we're talking about the 1980s before there is any systematic effort to build a structural form of cooperation. Military to military, serious intelligence cooperation, uh, Pentagon to Pentagon, particularly after Weinberger leaves as Secretary of Defense. Uh, George Shultz, who's the Secretary of State, presides over people who forget that Israel, after the Lebanon War, had an inflation rate of 1,260 percent. And George Shultz, over and above, it's a Carter administration because the Egyptian Israeli Peace Treaty that provides three, starts providing $3 billion a year, but it is uh, George Shultz, over and above that, who decides, given the Israeli inflation rates, if the Israelis will undertake economic reforms, he then adds $3 billion to what is the existing assistance, and the inflation rate goes from 1,260% a year to 15%. The other significant thing about the Reagan administration is it's the first administration where you have a countervailing constituency that emerges, a countervailing body of experts who view Israel through a very different lens. They view Israel as a partner, not as a liability. They see Israel's assets as something that can be a benefit to the United States, and they take a collaborative approach. And from that administration on, you see more of a debate within administrations between these two countervailing kinds of, of mindsets. Now, the mindset that was embodied in those who viewed Israel as, a, as basically a problem they were guided by three sets of assumptions. And these assumptions became very much embedded uh, in the national security bureaucracy. Uh, they, they really do go back to the Roosevelt time. Uh, and they're driven by a fundamental premise that association with Israel is costly. So there's three interrelated assumptions that this group has. I will say the third assumption is one that is shared by the countervailing constituency as well, but not to the same extent. The first assumption is for us to do well with the Arabs, we have to distance ourselves from Israel. You have to create a gap. And if you create a gap, the Arabs will respond to you. The second assumption is, and it's a corollary, is that if you do things, if you cooperate with Israel, that will cost you with the Arabs. So obviously there's a relationship between two. And the third is that if you could just make peace between Israelis and Palestinians in particular, then the American position in the, in the Middle East would be great. There'd be no problems. Everything would fall into place, not fall apart. So those three assumptions are embedded, and you see them existing in every administration up till today. One of the things I do in the book is to show that these assumptions were misguided, that they didn't reflect an understanding of the region. They didn't understand the priorities of those of the Arab states, the Arab leaders, and the like. 